So Whitney, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I think that there's been a demand for this sort of conference for a long time. Um, and uh, it's good that finally someone put it together. Um, I don't think that, I can't recall of a short focused f conference with as many activist short sellers in the past. Um, so excited to be speaking. Um, all right, I'm gonna work hard to keep this within 15 minutes. Uh, my name is Sam Adrangi. I'm with Carisdale Capital. Uh, we've been in operation for nine years. We manage approximately $180 million. Um, we built our business around short activism. Uh, and like many of the short activists that will be up here, we first um, began publishing our research on shorts in 2010 uh, uh, during the era of Chinese frauds, uh, when short sellers um, eradicated 10 to $20 billion of capital that was being invested in fraudulent Chinese companies. Um, and since then, we've focused mostly on US names, particularly in sectors that are complex. Uh, we share our research in a variety of ways. Um, we post our research to our website, so please visit our site at carisdalecap.com. Uh, you can subscribe to our research and re re uh, receive our research via our email uh, distribution list. We also post on Twitter. We have 25,000 followers on Twitter. Our handle is carisdalecap. Um, in certain uh, cases where our research has broader appeal, we'll go on CNBC or Bloomberg. We also post on Seeking Alpha. And uh, we're the only other uh, firm outside of Pershing Square to have uh, hosted a live presentation on one of our shorts. We did it on Global Star, uh, one of our favorite campaigns in our history. Our most recent short activism campaigns um, over the past two months have been on St. Joe, a developer of land in the Florida Panhandle, um, that where we think the land is worth half of what the market's valued at. Uh, we published on Quinn Street, which is going to be uh, part of the topic that I'm going to be presenting on today and uh, proteostasis, a biotech with a drug candidate for cystic fibrosis that we think is gonna fail its phase three trials. So let's jump to the topic that I'm gonna be discussing today, which is opportunities in ad fraud. So one of the reasons I like ad fraud is because uh, it allows us to combine an element of social good within our short activism. That's something we're always looking to do. A lot of the names that we publish on are really about you know, why a certain stock price should be lower than where it's trading at. Um, but when we can find situations where in the Chinese frauds we can eradicate billions of dollars of Chinese frauds, or if you think of Pershing Square's campaign on Herbalife, where he attempted to uh, trigger reforms in multi-level marketing schemes, um, that's an added benefit that can allow our research to have broader appeal. And I think we have that um, when we're writing on ad, uh, when short activists are writing on ad tech companies uh, that are allowing, uh, that are benefiting from ad fraud on their platforms. So what is ad fraud? If you just go to Wikipedia, you'll see that ad fraud is defined as the practice of fraudulently representing online advertisement impressions, clicks, conversions, or data events uh, to generate revenue. So what does that mean? Well, let's say you're Kellogg's or Coca-Cola, and you're looking to um, spent $25,000 on online advertisements. Well, if your display ads are put on a fake website that's not receiving any actual human traffic, but rather um, it's only being viewed by computers, the traffic that's resulting in that site seeming substantial enough to be on the ad exchange is really just coming from computers and bots and botnets. And when your ad goes on that site, it's only getting clicked on, not by humans, not by actual potential buyers of your uh, Coca-Cola soda or your uh, Kellogg's Corn Flakes, but rather by bots that are being designed by hackers in Eastern Europe that are really just looking to get that $25,000 for them as opposed to having it go to a legitimate publisher that you know real internet users are visiting, ad fraud is going on. And uh, this is clearly bad for uh, the online advertising landscape. The more ad fraud that occurs, the less the online advertising buyers are going to be willing to spend on online ads, and that's gonna deprive much needed revenue from legitimate publishers. And so, one of the reasons that it's interesting for short activists is because um, one of the reasons that ad fraud is so pervasive is because the intermediaries here benefit. Um, oftentimes, the ad exchanges and the ad agencies benefit from 
the number of clicks, the number of impressions that a certain online ad receives. And the more ad fraud that occurs, the more clicks occur. And uh, we believe there are many instances that certain ad tech companies are benefiting from all the ad fraud that's going on. And that's resulting in them being slow to adopt new detection schemes, new ways of preventing the ad fraud. Um, and if they have, say, 25% of the traffic that's going through the exchange uh, occur as a result of um, uh, bots and botnets just clicking on uh, their customers' ads, if they benefit from that, then that provides an opportunity for short activists to come out, explain what's going on, and benefit on the short side. I'll go through a few brief examples of uh, specific types of ad fraud. You have click fraud. Um, that occurs in pay-per-click online advertising, where uh, rather than humans clicking on a certain display ad, you see automated scripts or bots uh, entering those clicks. You'll have fake sites. There are sites out there that have no content, a tremendous amount of traffic, and then just fake, uh, just ad after ad after ad. Um, and these are clearly uh, put together by bad actors um, as a way to um, generate revenue via exchanges by selling sort of these fake impressions. Um, you have ad stacking and ad stuffing. Those are situations where, let's say you've got a video ad, and there'll be other videos behind the ad that the internet user is seeing. So you'll visit a site, you'll watch a video, and behind that video there are other videos playing in the background. Those videos are getting charged to the online advertising buyer, but they're not actually getting seen by anyone. Um, you'll have instances where a given display ad is put in a one by one pixel on a website. And so impressions get encountered when someone visits those websites. But again, that ad isn't actually getting seen by anyone. Um, in all of these in instances, the intermediaries benefit as those impressions uh, rack up, as those clicks rack up. Uh, the ultimate loser is the buyer of the online advertisements. But because of the opacity of the entire online advertising landscape, it's difficult to detect uh, whether your ad is getting be being viewed by humans or by bots. Um, we talked about the social good element of uh, this form of short, social, uh, uh, short activism, which is particularly why we find it attractive. Uh, and it's something we're going to be making a focus of, you know, hopefully throughout the rest of this year. Um, and then it's also an opportunity, again, because of the complexity that is, uh, a, that, that is behind these, uh, this online advertising landscape. The technology here is rapidly evolving. And the bad actors are using increasingly sophisticated methods to um, you know, trick the exchanges, trick the inter intermediaries uh, to generate revenue off of uh, the back of these online advertisers. And that provides an opportunity for us, because short activism often thrives in situations where the longs just really don't know what they own. And if we can um, put together a very high quality diligence, uh, put it in our research, uh, we can benefit from uh, triggering a debate and discussing topics that the longs hadn't necessarily investigated. Um, and, and oftentimes when that occurs, you'll see a discount enter into evaluation uh, until uh, the market becomes uh, more appreciative of the true nature of the business model. And we very much saw that with Quinn Street, uh, which is the name I'll talk about next. Um, Quinn Street was a business that if you look at the investor presentations and you look at the management comments, it's very difficult to tell exactly where the revenue comes from and the specific nature of the business lines, how much of the revenue is coming from lead generation, how much of it is coming from um, uh, their platform that matches uh, the progressives and Geico's of the world with the uh, website on which they're displaying their ads. Um, and we found, as we did uh, deeper work, we found multiple instances of, of ad fraud going on there, or suspicious traffic. Um, oftentimes, with short activists in this uh, situation, you can't actually say, hey, is it 40% of the revenue that's coming from phony traffic, or is it 5%? But uh, I think we were successful in the case of Quinn Street last month in triggering a debate about exactly where the revenue is coming from. Uh, one of the most uh, obvious examples of suspicious traffic was a, with a website called Insurance Branch. So Quinn Street um, has two lines of business. One is its uh, lead generation business where it has websites like insurance.com or schools.com 
where, uh, that provide informational articles about for-profit education or auto insurance, but they also provide a way in which visitors to the site can fill out forms and enter their information. That information is passed on as leads to potential customers in the for-profit education and, and auto insurance space. Um, they also have a part of the business that acts as a platform that connects buyers of online advertising with uh, sellers of online advertising. And one of those sites was, is nextinsure.com. And if you go to SimilarWeb, you'll see that the number one source of traffic to NextInsure comes from a website called insurancebranch.com. So why is Insurance Branch receiving so much traffic that it's then passing on to, to Quinn Street? Well, Insurance Branch isn't one of those sites that show up if you search auto insurance in Google. Rather, it's a site that nobody would, you know, on their own visit just simply to, uh, to you know, investigate you know, what provider of auto insurance they want. They want. Rather, if you Google insurancebranch.com, you'll see forum posts on Reddit and other sites that recommend it as a site to go to receive swag bucks. So what are swag bucks? Swag bucks are um, a way in which to have incentivized clicks and incentivized filling out of polls. As an internet user, if you have some free time, you can go on a website, fill out a poll, um, watch some ads, and you'll get these swag bucks that you can then monetize into dollars or Amazon gift cards. And what Insurance Branch was doing is it was uh, offering swag bucks for those who came and watched this insurance ads, watched videos, um, and entered their information that were then passed on as leads. But the problem for the ultimate customer of the online advertising is that these these customers aren't actually looking to buy auto insurance. Rather, they're trying to get swag bucks. So this is a form of phony traffic. And this was the number one source of traffic in the months prior to our report to Quinn Street. That certainly is a red flag. And it's something that's not discussed in any of the company disclosures. Um, there were multiple other sites. Uh, in LowIncomeCarInsurance.com, uh, which is an affiliated website, more than a third of the traffic came from Brazil. Um, the site is selling US car insurance. Why is there so much traffic com coming from Brazil? If you go to autoinsurance.insure.com, uh, virtually all of the referral traffic were coming from sites that are affiliated with toolbars, um, pop ups, polls, um, and again, uh, sites that are driving traffic towards these sites that are probably not um, due to actual ultimate buyers of insurance, but folks who are trying to earn money on the internet. Um, we did Quinn Street last month. The other report that comes to mind um, that attacks this topic of ad fraud uh, came out in the fourth quarter of last year uh, by Gotham City Research and an uh, uh, anonymous blogger on Seeking Alpha called The Friendly Bear. And they published extensive research on a company called Criteo. And Criteo is an ad tech vendor. It's known particularly in the retargeting space. Um, and some of the allegations here were very serious. Uh, these short activists um, suggested that over 50% of Criteo's traffic came from suspect sources, botnets, fake websites. Um, less than 5% of Criteo's users were responsible for north of 25% of clicks. That's another typical sign of um, phony and suspicious traffic. Um, and the result is, you know, there's now a trigger that's, that's, uh, that's uh, ensued. Um, on whether Criteo is really benefiting, how much of Criteo's business is benefiting from ad fraud. So I'll conclude. Um, you know, I think the online advertising space is an attractive area for short activists. Um, I think there's a lot of opacity in the market. Um, the disclosures here are scant on uh, exactly how much of the business is coming from what business lines. And I think short activists can have a role to play in, um, you know, casting, you know, there's sort of a line in short access and sunshine is the best disinfectant. And I think the more uh, short sellers are able to trigger a debate around you know, how much these intermediaries are benefiting from ad fraud, that'll both prove, uh, you know, a source attractive shorts uh, in addition to um, doing a bit of social good and triggering potentially potential reforms at some of these ad tech providers and agencies and other intermediaries that sit between the bad actors and the ultimate buyers of online advertising. So that's my topic. Um, I'll be around at the conference throughout the rest of the day. Uh, feel free to grab me. I'm always interested to, to talk ideas. 
um, or anything short activism related. Thanks again to Whitney for organizing this conference. Looking forward to hearing everyone else.